Hi all, this is lecture three of marketing research course where we are starting to consider the primary research methods and which is the best ones to be selected. Uh, today I am talking about the qualitative methods which relates to chapters four, five and six of your textbook. So in terms of what we're going to cover today, I'm going to talk about what qualitative research is, and then I'm going to look at the three major types of qualitative research, interviews, focus groups, and observation methods. So the learning objectives that today's topics cover uh, relate to uh, objectives two and three of the subject. Um, choose the methodologies to acquire evidence in an ethical manner to address the marketing problem and also three which is retrieve primary and secondary data to solve marketing problems so the primary data in this case is qualitative data so where does qualitative research sit within the research classification system it sits underneath primary data and it's data that is retrieved for a particular purpose to address the problem at hand but qualitative data refers to not numbers essentially uh, it refers to words images sounds film it refers to everything that is not a number however this is a continuum between quantitative and qualitative so just the same as you can count words, there, um, the, the border between these two is somewhat um, amorphous. It just depends on how you treat the data. So when do we use qualitative research? Qualitative is best used in exploratory designs or when you're just trying to gain preliminary insights. So some of the work we have done in your secondary data is also considered qualitative research. So in conducting your literature review and reviewing the secondary sources, as long as that data is actually the words that were written at those, in those secondary sources, it's considered qualitative research. So we use secondary qualitative sources to help us um, define our decision problems and the opportunities that we have um, and also exploratory research is good for when we don't know exactly what's going on we don't know which concepts we should be testing which concepts can be measured or it's just not possible to measure the, the things that we're interested in so some of the methods that are included in qualitative designs include things like interviews, open-ended question, questioning, probing or follow-up questions, observation, consumer feedback. Um, I've also known companies to do research on the social media images that customers place on on platforms so I know that the champagne industry from France conducted a study of people using doing champagne selfies so how do people display themselves using a champagne bottle or the champagne drink so this provides insights into how consumers use and display champagne champagne in their everyday lives and it's not necessarily how often they display champagne usage in their everyday lives because champagne is by and large a celebratory drink and not something drunk every day. So quantity is not necessarily as important in this set situation as the qualitative insights from how people display champagne when they're conducting a survey, uh, when they're making a selfie. So when do we use quantitative research? Well, we're about to come across a whole bunch of very measurement type of words. So quantitative is used when we're trying to validate a problem or obtain detailed description, testing theories or models, 
testing and assessing the reliability and validity of scales, assessing the effectiveness of the marketing strategy, as in have sales actually increased, have website traffic increased, those sorts of measures of market strategy effectiveness. If we're interested in new products, which is preferred, A or B? And finally, segmenting and comparing large or small differences in marketing or in customer groups. So in order to determine the size of a market, we need to measure and count the number of people who exist within a particular segment. So quantitative relies on having clear set concepts and ways of measurement prior to the research being conducted. Whereas qualitative is much more amorphous where the question might change as the research is conducted as we gain insight from our respondents as to what it is that we should be looking at. So that's that exploratory. We're exploring the problem in order to more accurately define what our problem actually is. So some of the goals of qualitative research, so these are much more general in nature. So identify a business problem or opportunity. Establish what information we require. We can understand customer purchase behavior. Determine the preliminary effectiveness of the marketing strategies. So if we have launched a new communication campaign, instead of trying to do a large scale survey of whether people remember that campaign, it might be too early for memory to be effectively measured. So maybe we need to go to a few key expert users or high involvement users and ask them what they think of the new communication campaign. Qualitative research is also used to develop scale measurements. So in consumer behavior, we covered the concept of attitude or decision rules. In these concepts, it requires you to know what attributes people are using to choose a product. It requires you to know um, which ones are important, which one may not be important. What alternatives are people considering when making a decision? And what kind of decision process are they going through when making that decision? So qualitative research can provide that information it is an initial step that then gets translated and transformed into a quantitative measure of those issues. Qualitative research is also extremely useful in building theories and models. So when we don't know what's going on and we don't know what the cause of our problems may be, qualitative research can help us develop that conceptual framework th further. If the existing academic literature and secondary sources can't tell us the underlying concepts or drivers of our problems, then qualitative research is a way of identifying and building theories around those key concepts. And finally, qualitative research is used to obtain insights as to the motivation, emotional and attitudinal and personality factors that drive um, customer behavior either towards or away from our particular product. So for example, I've there's been qualitative research done on people's motivations to comply with new social campaigns to stop drink driving. So this idea of what are the, the social factors that are influencing people's attitudes towards drink driving. Is it simply a fear of the police or is people have just a much more negative emotional connotation to that sort of behavior? So qualitative research can provide insights in these kinds of circumstances. So in choosing qualitative research, the first step is always what is the question that the problem that we want answered and do we need more exploratory designs in order to address this issue. 
So the, the advantages of qualitative research include that it can be quite economical and timely in terms of its data collection. By and large, we're dealing with small sample sizes. While this has the adverse disadvantage of a lack of generalizability, it does mean that you can conduct five, six, ten interviews in a short period of time in order to gather sufficient data to understand what, what um, needs to happen next, essentially. The data itself, under most qualitative research designs, is extremely rich. So you don't just get a, a number of people who are interested in a product, you'll get people's deep and, and insightful understanding of you get their life histories, of their experiences with that product, what they think of the product, what their husband or spouse thinks of that product, and what their friends have said about that product. So it's not just it's not just a single data point that is collected. You get numerous data points of someone's perspective as they compare their own versus the people around them's perspective with that particular product. However, with this richness of data, you do get the adverse effect that sometimes small differences are lost. So when someone says that they like a product, how is that different from someone who says that they really like a product or someone that says that they love a product? Are these simply just linguistic you know, nuances or are these small differences that have underlying causes that we have yet to pinpoint and understand? So qualitative research also has benefits in its accuracy of recording marketplace behaviour. Within the richness of that data set, we get a lot of detail in terms of how people are actually behaving and how they're feeling about that behaviour. But on the flip side, we have this lack of reliability. There's a lot of um, issues around how reliable is the person's memory of their behaviour in the marketplace, unless you're actually interviewing people while they're doing it. Interviews and focus groups tend to be related to people's past me memories of their past behaviours. So there are um, biases in the, in the process of the respondent themselves being able to report accurately their behaviours. And also the fact that there's a lot of re um, reliance on the interviewer themselves not introducing any bias into the process. And finally, we can, the advantage, key advantages of qualitative research is the building of preliminary insights and models and also scale measurements that can be used to conduct further research. But like, unlike quantitative methods where if there are many tools that will help you run the numbers, uh, Qualitative research in terms of its collection and its analysis requires um, well-trained investigators both to design, conduct and to analyse the data. And because this is a more specialised field, there are a lot less of these trained um, professionals available. But if you are considering a, a, a career in marketing research, the lack of trained personnel in, in qualitative research methods does provide an opportunity as well-trained qualitative investigators tend to be better paid than their quantitative counterparts. So just an overview of the qualitative versus quantitative decision. So qualitative research is concerned with the human behaviour from the informant's perspective and assumes a dynamic and negotiated reality as in that reality is always changing and that the respondent is always having to make trade-offs with between themselves and the external world as to what they're trying to achieve in that reality. Whereas quantitative research is more concerned with discovering facts about social phenomena and it assumes a fixed and measurable reality. 
So in quantitative, if we're talking about identity, in, quanti in, in quantitative, we would say that we are measuring a person's identity at that particular point in time. Whereas in qualitative, we can explore the idea of identity as it might change over time. Methodologically, qualitative data collected through participant observation and interviews, it's much more word-based than quantitative. Basically, we tend to look for themes and descriptions from the informant's perspective. And we tend to report the language in the report the data in the language of the informant as as in when we report qualitative data we will tend to use quotes so Joe Blow said he really you know I really like Ikea in the morning so if that's the what Joe Bloggs actually said we will report that actual data as a quote in quantitative data collected through measuring things so the assumption is that all concepts need to be measurable in order for quantitative to be appropriate. Data are anal analyzed using numerical comparison and statistical inferences. So a t-test, a test of difference, a test of association, a test of inter, um, inter something or other, which I've forgotten off the top of my head. And finally, Data is reported through statistical analyses and data are aggregated. So we report data as the aggregation of the sample. So we don't talk about just one person within a quantitative sample. We would talk about a sample of 100 people as a whole. So in choosing qualitative research methods, we have numerous different methods to p and these are generalizations here, but by and large, we differentiate the which one is more appropriate depending on what it is we are trying to achieve. So in qualitative research methods, depending on whether your, your unit of analysis is the individual or, the, or more a group, so if it's more individual, we would tend to use interviews or observations. And it also depends on whether our insights we are interested in relate to seeing people operate in their actual real world settings versus whether we just, it's enough to get people to reflect on their real world experiences but not necessarily having to be in the setting at that particular point in time. For example, can you sit in a, a room with someone and talk about your experiences at IKEA, or do you need to actually be at an IKEA store in order to be able to provide the kind of information that the, is of interest to the, um, the research project? So, in terms of more individual and out of the real world settings, we'll tend to look at interviews. Face-to-face, -face, individual interviews. Often these are conducted in neutral locations in order to um, make the respondent feel more comfortable in the professionalism of the interview interviewer. However, in some cases, interviews do get conducted in people's homes, for instance. When IKEA first came to Canberra before it arrived, it did at-home in-depth interviews with Canberrans. They went to people's houses, they asked them about how they lived, they looked in their kitchen cupboards, they asked them about how they stored their bath towels. Essentially, IKEA was looking for the types of homes people lived in in Canberra and how they lived in those homes. So in that instance, instead of doing an artificial setting, they chose to do an interview in the real world setting. In, if you are interested in more group level dynamics, but don't need to have people in the real world setting, then a focus group is appropriate. 
focus groups provide more insight than say observation pure observation but less than interviews but they also get to a group dynamic issue so rather than it being a one-on-one -on -one interview where the interviewee is only referring to the people they know in a focus group you can get people talking to each other about their different perspectives and getting a conversation going about resolving some of the differences or revealing new ways of thinking that wouldn't emerge if it was just one person talking about their own experiences. So focus groups are good in that way. However, the group dynamics can create their own dilemma in that they, um, you need to be able to effectively manage a focus group in order for every person in that focus group to provide enough insight. So if we're looking at more individual behaviours in real world settings, pure observation or non-participant observation techniques often uh, take the form of more quantitative techniques. So these will be simply be counting the someone shopping. How many people enter a shop? What are the demographic characteristics of the people entering that shop? It could be the foot traffic in a shopping mall. It could be, also includes watching people as they shop in store. So those security cameras in the supermarkets don't just get used to stop people shoplifting. They can also be used to monitor people's shopping behavior. How do people flow through the store? How long do they spend in the store? How long do they spend in each area of the store? And how long do they spend making a decision? So that is more covert observation. There are less, there are, there are non-covert forms of observation of people shopping. So increasingly we're seeing the use of um, MRI kind of imaging. So having consumers, customers shopping with brain and emotional monitor monitoring devices that are recording how they feel while they're shopping, what they're, they'll include eye tracking, so it'll include what they look at when they shop, and all the other data I've already included. So in this observation area, there is this difference between covert versus non-covert observation. Sometimes there is the assumption that if you are observing people covertly, then the people being watched don't know about it. However, there is evidence that that's just not the case. So there was a famous study done in management about the, the level of lighting's effect on um, employee productivity. So the person in charge of the study basically lowered the lighting. And what they found it strange was that productivity increased. Eventually someone actually asked the employees what was going on and basically they said that they knew they were being watched and that they thought that the, lower of the, the lowering of the lighting was basically a punishment for not being productive so they worked harder. So in terms of the covertness of the observation, it being assumed to be covert when actually it wasn't, that being watched or surveillance can change people's behavior outside of the conditions of what you are trying to observe. So that's something to be careful of with observation methods. And finally, we have participant observation. So examples of this are ethnography, but also netnography, which is ethnography on the internet. So this is where we observe customers in the real world or in their in their natural habitat we interact with them we might conduct an interview with them we might do focus groups with them participant observation is a much more flexible way of understanding um, the customer experience however it's much more resource intensive 
the goal of participant observation is for the researcher to take on the the role of a insider to whatever group is un under study so they just they are trying to become like the, a person in the group so therefore having the same level of insight as members of that group but um, argue but there's arguments over whether that's possible and again I, as I said it's very resource intensive in terms of time and having someone with the expertise to do this effectively so I'll go through some of these these methods in more detail so the first method I'm going to talk about is interviewing. It's one of the most common types of marketing research at the qualitative level. So I'm going to look at what it is and the types. So interviews are a formalized process in which a well-trained interviewer asks ask a subject a set of semi-structured questions in a face-to-face -face setting. So some of the key ideas here is that the interviewer needs to be trained. You have a subject, a, also known as a respondent or an interviewee, who answers the questions. And we have this idea of semi-structured questions. The level of structure of the questions depends on the research question that, that is of interest. However, the beauty or the complete advantage of interviews is their flexibility in the ability to change the question that is being asked to suit the respondent who is answering them. This might mean simply asking your questions in a different order or it could be the, the respondent hasn't understood the initial question so it might need to be rephrased, it might need to be broken down into a number of different questions or it could be that the respondent says something unexpected but the interviewer thinks it's interesting and relevant so the interviewer asks more questions what we call probing questions in order to further understand this thing whatever it happens to be that the respondent has said the other thing to notice here is it says face-to-face -face setting so yes, while most interviews tend to be conducted face to face because it's trying to get to a relaxed conversational level of interaction where the respondent is feels that they are free and open to talk about possibly some very private concerns that they have with the interviewer. However, interviews can be conducted online, they can be co conducted over the telephone, I've done all of these methods of interviews and the protocols and the, and the, and the method of getting that um, to that level of uh, respondent comfortableness or rapport is slightly different in each setting. So often in a telephone or a online interview using say Skype, there just needs to be a little bit more time set up doing a bit more chit chat than might be the case if you are face to face because particularly in telephone interviews where you can't actually see the person you are talking to you are basically relying on voice so you need to get people used to voice cues in a conversation rather than just relying on um, on sound because you've lost all that visual or nonverbal communication ability So, in terms of being an interviewer, you need to have good interpersonal communication skills. So this doesn't necessarily mean that you're an extrovert and you like to talk a lot. This, could, this includes the ability to actually hear what the other person is saying and to be able to carry a conversation that is um, both structured but also flows. It also includes the ability to listen. What is the what has the person said? Responding to what that person has said rather than worrying about what is the next question I need to ask. This is one of the key skills in interviewing is to let go of your semi-structured questions 
and just have in your mind the key areas that you want covered but being in the moment and listening to what the person is actually saying at, in that moment. So therefore, in filtering through all the possible questions that you are going to ask, to, to then ask the most appropriate question that comes next, that keeps the conversation flowing. You also need inter interpretive skills. This is both during the interview and afterwards. So while listening to what people are saying, you need to be interpreting what's being said in relation to what does that actually mean for the project. So if I say I like IKEA, is, it, is that simply relating to my emotional attachment to the IKEA brand or am I expressing some sort of brand loyalty? Those are two different concepts and that's up to the interviewer to interpret and if I'm unsure, it means I need to ask a question of the, of the respondent. Do you, you know, what do you mean by this? In order to try and interpret the exact meaning of what is being said. Personality suitability. So while you don't necessarily have to be an extrovert, you do need to be interested in the viewpoints of others. And finally, I, yeah, ability to probe. And this has nothing to do with aliens and everything to do with the ability to follow, to, to make on the spot judgments about follow up questions. What sh after someone has said something, what should be the next question I ask? So the steps in in depth interviewing, again, uh, we're going to go through this much more in the tutorial workshop. Uh, so basically the broad steps are what is the interview answering in terms of the decision problem research question? Create a set of appropriate questions that a lay person respondent that can answer but don't necessarily aren't necessarily the same questions as your research questions because they might be different things. Decide on the best interview environment. Where are you going to conduct the interview? Screen and select a suitable subjects. Who are you going to interview? Then you need to contact them, provide them gu guidelines, get them comfortable, then begin the interview. Conduct the in-depth interview, transcribe the interview, which we'll do all later analyze the subject's narrative responses and write a summary report. So in terms of what do I mean by conducting an in uh, the in-depth interview, the best example I have is actually a video that is available on Wattle on how to conduct an in-depth interview. It goes through both good and bad practice. So. I strongly suggest you have seen that video before coming to class in week three. So the types of interviews that are available. So these are not a, a complete list, but these are a broad areas. So experience interviews is where we are trying to get to experts, people who are highly involved, high levels of knowledge. Um, if our respondents that we're interested in are actually from other businesses. Who are the experts in those businesses that we should be talking to? So protocol interviews have decision making scenarios. So in scenario A, given, a, given that you are now a couple who is buying a bed at IKEA, go through the decision making process that you would if you're in that situation. So it's setting up a scenario and then asking the respondents to basically tell you what they would do in that situation. So articulative interviews are group interviews to identify value conflicts with goods and services. So the groups may or may like the members of the group may or may not be uh, known to each other. But essentially, we're just trying to get to um, differences in 
how they understand or value or the meanings of products or brands that members have. And then we have this wide range of projective interviews. So we have things called a word association test. So if I say Nike, you say, I say ant, you say, I say blue, you say. So these are developed out of psychology and the assumption is that we're getting to top of mind associations that people have between various concepts in their memory. So if it means that if I use a, this word association and I say Nike, I should be able to get to your top of mind or your initial impressions or memories that you have of Nike. Similarly, we can do sentence completion tests. Basically, I'm getting ready to go to university. The first thing I do is. So this idea that we start a sentence and then by completing the, the, the sentence, the respondent tells us something about themselves as a narrative form. So they have to put themselves in a place in a time and project themselves doing something. We can have picture tests where we can show images the same way we can throw out words. We can show images and have people talk about those images, tell stories about the images, um, have uh, word associations with those images. There's all sorts of things that can happen with pictures. Thematic appreciation tests. This is a particular type of protocol that I will let you read about in the textbook. Pardon me. Cartoon or balloon tests. So you have basically a cartoon where something is happening but the dialogue of what is going, going on in the cartoon is left blank. So it's up to the respondent to fill in the blanks of those cartoons. It lets you explore different um, particularly service encounters. So what's going on in this particular scenario in a McDonald's store, for, ex for instance. We can also do role playing activities. So unlike sentence completion tests where it's one person by themselves projecting themselves in a role, you have multiple people playing different roles in a scenario and having to project themselves and their ideas and their attitudes into the role that they are playing. And finally, the Zoltman metaphor elicitation technique is a fairly complicated method um, of interviewing. It's actually quite quantitative in its analysis, but it's basically tr again trying to get to people's deep linguistic associations that they have between concepts, brands, products and ideas. So finally, in-depth interview, the advantages is it's extremely flexible form of data collection. You can get a large amount of detailed data and you have the opportunity to probe the respondent for further information, further clarification, um, and to further explore new ideas that might emerge. But it does su su suffer from a, a few disadvantages. You know, it lacks generalizability. It's not very nuanced. Um, reliability, validity issues in terms of the way the data is collected and respondents' ability to be to tell you the truth, or not just their willingness, but their ability, especially for you having them refer back to past behaviors. And it can cost in terms of money and time. So the second method that is used is focus groups. Focus groups have the advantage over interviews in the fact that we can get to group dynamics more um, more easily and also 
because you have groups of six to ten people together talking about a, a, an issue, you can get a bigger sample size while not getting quantitative levels of generalizability, you can get a greater range of opinions using a focus group. So a focus group is a formalized process of bringing a small group of people together for an interactive, spontaneous discussion on one particular concept or topic. So they tend to be between six to 10 people and they're used to address issues and topics of um, consumers' perceptions and preferences and behaviours concerning a product category. So on Waddle, I've provided an, a, an example of um, barbecue users, people who like to barbecue, preference for and perception of a flip top lid packaging option on the on a barbecue sauce. So this could also fall into the second one, which is obtaining impressions of new product categories, generating new ideas about older products. So what are the problems encountered by users of barbecue sauce when barbecuing? So we can possibly um, update our barbecue sauce in ways that would be appreciated by this segment of the market. Developing creative concepts and materials for advertising. So how would barbecue users like to be portrayed in advertising? How would they like to see themselves in the ads in order for us to develop more appealing advertisements to this group? We can secure price impressions. So this value for money, how much are you willing to pay? And we can also use it to gain consumer reactions to existing marketing programs. So this is what we're already doing, what do you think? So this is when we're trying to get that initial reaction to marketing problems. So there are three phases to the focus group. I'm going to um, just talk briefly about the first two because they're very similar to the interview process. In planning the study, however, one of the key things to consider is the appropriate participant selection. In constructing a focus group, there is the need for the, the, what the type of members that are going to be included, the number of me members, and how long the focus group should and can go for. So in choosing focus group participants, there is consideration about who to include and who not to include, which then has follow on effects of how many you, you need to conduct. So for instance, when I worked in marketing research, we did a research project for an online dating website. And initially we did a survey and that was followed by focus groups in order to gain further insight into what we were looking at. So in terms of our focus group plan, what we wanted to look at was males versus females of different age groups, with the assumption being that people in different age groups were looking for different things out of relationships. So never been married before was a different segment to people who had been divorced previously. But that's a bit controversial in terms of um, segmenting people. So we chose to do it based on age. However, in terms of fulfilling our requirements, we had three age groups and we wanted to have two focus groups conducted per age group, so that made six females groups, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 60, and six male groups, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 60. However, what we found in trying to actually recruit participants into the focus groups was that Females were very happy to volunteer to participate in a, in a focus group, even though there were not going to be any men included in the focus group. We found that very, very, the first question that the men would ask when we were trying to recruit them to do the focus group was, are there going to be any women there? And when we said no, they then withdrew 
their interest in participating in the focus group. It tells you something about the motivations of um, members of online dating websites, but it also meant that instead of holding six focus groups of men of different age groups, we could only hold one focus group of men across all of the different age groups. One man, oh, as a side note, one man stood the focus group up and another one turned up drunk. So uh, my impressions of online dating websites have been tainted forever since doing that research. So here we have some of the requirements to consider when looking for fo focus group participants. Because we are looking at larger numbers, costs go up because you might need to provide incentives and we need to consider the number of focus groups that are feasible and are possible even you know despite um, you, know, you might have a plan but in reality it, it is determined by people people's willingness to participate so the other issue in focus groups is because they are group based the moderator, which is the same as the interviewer in the interview type of method, but the moderator is not only asking the questions, they're also managing the interpersonal dynamics of the group. Because what you also end up with in focus groups is people who might have stronger opinions or just might be more vocal in those opinions, who might talk over others, who might actually be not very nice people and um, dismiss other people's opinions in favor of their own and it's the moderator's role to manage these big personalities to make sure that everyone in that focus group gets the opportunity to voice their opinions and for that those opinions to be heard and to be considered. So moderators in fo of focus groups is um, an extremely important role in the marketing research industry and again um, well-trained and well-respected moderators are in short supply. So a focus group session is similar to a interview except that in the beginning session it is about enabling participants to introduce themselves to each other not just to the interviewer. And as the session goes on we get more um, specific towards the topics of interest and then closing with more general kinds of reflections on what um, you have discussed. In analysing the data, it's important to consider the following. And this analysis applies to interview or focus group data. We need to consider the words used, the, con uh, the context in which it's said, the frequency of comments, so how often something is said might be in, uh, indicative of how important that idea is. The intensity of the comments, so changes in tone, in volume, in speed, all of these can have um, indicate that something is of particular importance. So the specificity of responses, so with first-hand experiences versus recounting someone else's. And once we've looked at all the, the specifics and the individual data, we then need to build up to consider the big picture. So we need to aggregate into themes or ideas or concepts and how these relate together. And finally, observation methods and its variants. So observation is the systematic activity of witnessing and recording events or behavioural patterns of people and other entities without directly communicating with them. So this is very specific to a certain type of observation. So this is non-participant observation. So in the picture that you see there, you have someone who is interviewing someone else and the interviewer is participating. However, the person who is sitting behind the desk with the notepad, that person is observing. 
So we can have multiple levels of data collection, both in person or interpersonal and non-participant observation happening at the same time. Observation is also used in um, a lot of retail settings to look at um, customer behaviour in store, often using technologies. So the different Behaviours that can be observed include physical actions, so consumer shopping patterns, how long they spend in a, in a store, when they attend the store, what they're looking at in the store, those sorts of behavioural actions. Expressive and verbal behaviours, so we can actually record whether someone looks happy, sad, neutral, those sorts of um, verbal uh, expression can be used, the increasing use of face recognition software and face recognition with indi indications of what the face tells us about emotions are increasingly being used in this way. We have temporal behavioural patterns, so amount of time spent shopping online, um, how often people shop, those sorts of temporal issues, spatial relationships. How much space do you keep between you and other shoppers in store? So this tells us something about people's feeling of crowdedness and people's um, desire to be around others versus avoidance of others. So there's a difference between people thinking a restaurant is popular because it's crowded versus people thinking a restaurant is uncomfortable because it's crowded. So that's a spatial understanding of how, how do we feel about crowdedness or how do we behave when something is crowded. And physical objects, so purchase of brands in supermarkets. So what do we look at versus what do we pick off the shelf versus what do we buy. Observation in terms of the, the research questions it can answer, it can record what people do but not why they are doing it. So. It is a limited in terms of what the kind of research question it can answer. So I've mentioned some of these previously, but there are numerous mechanical and software based observation tools available. And increasingly we are seeing um, the combinations of multiple of these um, technologies. So you'll get eye tracking, so, um, Techni um, tools, technology, um, it's like glasses that you can put on with a um, sentiment analysis which monitors the brain which is a cap you can put on and it also monitors heart rate and also um, temperature, body temperature, these sort of minute bodily changes that indicate emotional responses with um, visual tracking of people's movements through a store. So there's numerous ways in which these technologies can be used both individually and in combination. However, in terms of doing observation, the first thing that needs to be decided is what is going to be observed and how is it going to be observed? So that Observation is unlike interviews or focus groups which have more flexibility. Observation is like quantitative where, where you need to decide beforehand, what we call a priori. To, the, to actually conducting the research, you have to have decided what is being measured before you start. Variants on observation which have more in common with interview techniques than they do with um, non-participant observation are ethnography and netnography. So I've discussed this previously and I've also given an extended um, example of ethnographic type of um, consumer research work on Wattle with a TED talk that is there. So ethnography is where the research becomes embedded in the group in which the behaviour is occurring. They tend to take a long time, they tend to be resource intensive, and um, 
they create a lot of documents, film, video, transcripts, field notes, photography, they, um, ethnography generates a lot of data that then needs to be analysed. Netnography operates on the similar principle, but the context in which the researcher is embedding themselves is online. So the researcher will embed themselves in a virtual community. So if you're particularly interested in barbecue, barbecuers, you might go to an online forum, a Facebook group that specializes in people who are highly involved in barbecuing. And you might become an embedded member of the barbecuing community online in order to understand what it means to be a barbecuer to, the, to that particular community. So in summary, we use qualitative methods when we need an exploratory design because we don't know what is relevant yet when we need deep insight into the lived experiences of customers, or when we need to develop concept or measurements in order to conduct quantitative um, research later. In choosing the different qualitative methods, we have four broad categories. Interviews provide deep insight and are flexible. However, they tend to be small samples with less generalizability but they can answer a broad range of research questions. Similarly, focus groups can generate new insights and um, can account for group dynamics. However, you get less individual insights and they have less flexibility than an interview and the group dynamics themselves can become a problem. But similarly, they can answer a broad range of research questions. Observation of the non-participant na nature has the advantage of recording actual behaviour. However, its disadvantage is that it's, it's quite inflexible in what and how you record of that behaviour. In terms of the research question answered, it can answer a lot of them, but can never address why someone is doing something. And finally, ethnography or netnography can provide deep insight, is flexible and includes group dynamics but has small sample sizes, which are less general, generalizable and is very resource intensive, but again can answer a vast range of research questions. So I have finished my overview of qualitative methods and the, and the ways and means of which we would select one over the other and their implementation. Next, we, next lecture is going to focus on how we analyse the data generated from our qualitative methods.